In some ways it's very difficult to write about the things that you're closest to. I'm adopted, I'm up for adoption again soon, I always offer that to people. Well I'm glad we're not doing just a minute because I'd be probably immediately thrown off for doing deviation. Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and in this final episode in our first season we're going to be talking about family. Forget any outdated notions of a nuclear family, we're going to be wondering what the term even means in 2019 as we hear from Jeanette Winterson, A.M. Holmes and Emily Pine. And of course, I'm joined here by my pals, Dan and Holly. Hello, both of you. Hello. Hello there. And of course, uh, I ask you to bring a little something to the table at the beginning of each episode. Who would like to go first? I'm happy to kick things off. Go for it, Hall. Uh, So we have a family WhatsApp group that was set up last year and it was called the name of our family in Oz so it was when a large group of us all went out to Australia together for a wedding and since coming home from Australia we have added extra relatives who did not come to Australia with us so it's now called family name not in Oz but kind of we have regular postings to it lots of pictures of like auntie and uncle's gardens and things but my cousin very excitedly yesterday got a puppy and sent a really lovely photo of her new puppy called Rupert. So a photo of him cuddled up in front of a sign that kind of said, Rupert, 14 weeks. And I was like, oh, the puppy, how lovely. And then her brother replied with a photo of a dog, not sure where he came from, Scout, three years. I was like, oh, nice, we're keeping the dog chat going. Mum then comes up to my bedroom and goes, lie on your bed. I was like, why? She was like, lie on your bed, I've made a sign. So I had to curl up and there was a sign put behind me that said, Holly, 24 years. <laughs> also sent to the dog family WhatsApp group. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. See, this is why I don't want a family WhatsApp group because it's going to turn into stuff like that. I'm... I have all of mine muted. No offence to my family if they're listening, but I just cannot handle the updates. Dan, what have you brought to the table? What I'm bringing to the table today is... My departure. Oh, no, don't. I'm not sure I'm ready for this. <laughs> um, yeah, this will be the last podcast I'm on. We are actually recording this on my last day working for Waterstones. Um, and yeah, this this is the end. Listeners, I'm afraid it is true. Dan Dan is leaving Waterstones. Where are you going, Dan? I'm going to join Granta. He's going to join Granta. Very I'm fine a publisher. publisher. Yeah. So um, I will no longer be on the podcast. It's a, it's a very big shame. Uh, Holly mm. and I are wiping away a, a podcast tier here. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got an emergency meeting after this recording about how to boost the podcast listens without me on the show. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, no. <laughs> Right, so we're going to talk about family in this podcast, and I think to get us going, I'm going to introduce our our first author, who is Jeanette Winterson. Now, she, of course, shot to fame with her debut novel, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which was semi-autobiographical and very much about family. Her most recent book is Frankenstein, and actually, weirdly, in other ways, is also about family, or rather sort of the challenges that are posed to it by things like artificial intelligence and robotics and things like that, and the arrival of the future. Mm. Um, So she began, actually, by answering or even asking herself the most important question of all. Family. Well, I'm glad we're not doing just a minute because I'd be probably immediately thrown off for doing deviation because what is a family? Um, I'm adopted, so for me the idea of family was fractured at once and I was brought up by a pair of Pentecostal evangelists who had a gospel tent and wanted me to save the world, um, which was unusual in itself. And... All I knew about my biological mother was that she was either um, dead, mad, drunk, a drug addict, or sometimes that she'd exploded, which always seemed to me to be rather exciting. None of this was true because she was alive. In fact, she still is. But, you know, Mrs. Winterson, my adopted mother, was a fantasist and was quite happy to, you know, invent whatever story she felt necessary for the moment, something which has been useful to me. Um, but. I suppose when I was a young person and I was, tr- I was, I was reading, which I was doing in the library because I wasn't allowed books at home, um, I was reading Dickens because in the library there was English literature and prose A to Z, so I started at A and it's good at the beginning, you know, because you get Austin, the Brontes, um, Comrade Dickens. And in Dickens I soon realised that the real families are the pretend ones and that what happens there is that the bonds of affection are made not, not through blood, not through biology, but through people coming together and, 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 and forming you know, affectionate relationships which sustain them through the, the cruelties and the difficulties of life. And, and, and the, the, this cheered me very much because I never liked, and obviously because it w- was removed from me, the, so the sort of the tribal, clannish 
idea of a family um, where you had to belong um, and where that's where your immediate loyalties lay and would continue to do so. And of course, as I went out into the world, I realised that most people really didn't like their families or at least certain aspects of their families. And everyone dreaded Christmas and hoped that somebody would get flu and not turn up. And so there were, there were many sort of shatterings and disappointments around this idea of family, which was nevertheless being peddled, certainly since the 1950s, uh, as something to which everybody should aspire and that had a kind of a glory and a stability and a sanity or all of its own when really we know that the nuclear family is a very late invention and that many people do not live like that and those who do often struggle with it um, so I suppose for me my family has always been my friends again those bonds of affection rather than bonds of biology which have sustained me and my family has also been books uh, not only the ones that I've written not just the mind children that I've created but uh, the ones that I've read, that, that sort of closeness, that recognition, if that's what happens in families, when you look at, I, I guess, because I've seen this, somebody looks at their child or their parent and they see a family resemblance, I can see that that's rather moving. Um, but I get that with, with writing, I suppose. I'm looking for a family resemblance in the books that I read. I can still argue you know, with that writer, um, but somewhere I feel that we're connected and, and that I, I belong to something which is much bigger than me and that stretches across time so that there is a, a lineage there or an ancestry um, which isn't biological at all. This may be why I feel quite comfortable with the idea of non-biological invented life forms made out of zeros and ones because I don't have the, the kind of emphasis uh, on blood and biology that some people do. Uh, so there's, there's all of that and do I, would I ever want to create one? Well, no, I didn't. I didn't have children of my own because I thought, why would I want to risk that? <laughs> why would I want to risk what happened to me? And I'd probably be, a, either I'd be a terrible mother um, because I'd be neglectful and I'd always be sort of rushing off to do something else, not least write books. Um, or I would be over anxious on top of the child. And I just thought, you know what, you've got choices in life. You don't need to do this. You can do something else. So I avoided it in that respect and made it in, in different ways. And also being gay, for, for gay people, less so now, but when I was growing up, when it was still um, uh, stigmatized and, and in some ways very difficult, uh, we all had to make our own family too. So you looked after one another. That was certainly the case through the AIDS crisis when uh, men and women came together just to, to, uh, to form loose-knit, what, what were family groups? You used to move in with people and help them through you know, their, their last days. So the idea of it as being something which is closed um, is anathema to me. What I would prefer is something which is much more open possible where people can come and go and feel feel nourished and looked after rather than feel rather guilty and put upon and also angry which is what happens most of the time um do i wish it could disappear completely the idea of family well i think it will so it doesn't really matter what i think because uh, as i think that human beings will certainly either wipe ourselves out quite soon through our stupidity over climate breakdown and general warfaring we deserve to be wiped out um we'll have to start again or if our, if our inventions come to pass and we are no longer the smartest thing on the planet, then the whole idea of family grouping will become redundant. And what will happen to us? We'll go and live in reservations with automobiles and shopping malls because that's about our level. And you know, we can send Christmas cards to our auntie that we hate and, and think that that's really living. And in the rest of the universe, there'll be a super intelligence uh, that is doing something very in interesting like colonizing space. I could just talk about how much I love Jeanette Winterson. Isn't she great? Uh, just, Amazing. I read The Passion by her, if, if either of you have read it. No. Um, no. I read it on holiday and I was in Turkey and I finished it as like the sun was setting. And I think and the book itself is just like kind of beautiful. It's, uh, it's one of my favourites. But the fact that I was reading it as the sun went down, it's now got mm. this like really like kind of warm memory attached to it. Anyway, sorry, that's completely off topic. But, but she's just great at sort of, you know, taking a word like family and giving you so many different thoughts yeah. about it. Absolutely. Um, and I like the way that she kind of takes apart the whole idea of family and, and, mm. and gives it a new spin. Mm. This whole kind of breaking down of the nuclear family is something that I've, I've thought about like a fair amount, actually, because growing up, one of my favourite TV shows, and to this day, is The Simpsons. I think it's <laughs> possibly the best television show that has ever been made. Um, seasons 1 to 10. Um, <laughs> maybe 1 to 12. Um, it's 
it's phenomenal. But quite recently, there was a play put on at the Almeida called uh, Mr. Burns. I don't know if it, this was several years ago now, but um, and it's about a, a post-apocalyptic world um, in which the, it starts out and pe- it's a group of friends trying to recreate an episode of The Simpsons. The second act then moves a bit further in the future and there started to be these kind of like groups of travelling actors who tour around performing episodes of The Simpsons for money. And then the final act of the play is very distant future and this kind of like The Simpsons have become like deities and like kind of gods and they're on the world should say. It's, it's wild. But I think it's kind of relates to what Jeanette Winterson is saying there in an interesting way of like, hmm. what does this image of the nuclear, like does this image of the family, the nuclear family, which hmm. The Simpsons is a prime example of does mm. that hold up in the future we're headed towards mm, yeah and as she said absolutely not i quite like the fact you know when she was talking about obviously as a, a gay woman mm. thinking about how family mm. for her in the future is completely different and then she was talking about the the way that the gay community had set up these mm. kind of the same kind of companionship as a family it reminds me of a book i read recently called this brutal house by niven govenden which is about the new york vogue ball scene actually but it's the the sort of the matriarchs of that family are are called the mothers even though none of them Mm. are mothers um and they look after the younger people in this sort of so it has this family structure but but actually based very much around female figures rather Mm. than sort of male figures but it has that same nourishing thing i guess that same thing of protecting protection choosing your own family yeah yes the thing that (coughs) stuck out for me throughout that extract was actually um how from, obviously she's been adopted so from birth she's had a very kind of different perspective and take on family to mm. a lot of other people and maybe that has completely altered perceptions as she has grown up and kind of found other people in similar circumstances to then build mm. these kind of forced relationships and family with mm. I think if, if that's if your brain is shaped as a child to see family in one way then it, it's definitely going to have an impact on how you see it in the future in fact weirdly uh, the other author I want to introduce um, in the podcast is A.M. Holmes, who was also adopted. Um, and in fact, she wrote a memoir about her adoption called The Mistress's Daughter. Um, she's also uh, won the Women's Prize for Fiction for a novel called May We Be Forgiven. And so her fiction is actually dotted with families. She's often looking at the family unit. Um, but I wanted to ask her, first of all, about what it was like writing about families in fiction and then, of course, writing about them in nonfiction. You know, I think in my writing... Um... It certainly obviously interests me a lot. I think that my big influences really come from people like Harold Pinter and Edward Albee and John Cheever. So I credit them with being sort of my my literary fathers who definitely twisted my sense of what that family unit should be. And then again, those splits between the notion of what the ideal family is or the sort of the family of the American dream, which was, you know, the two cars. Now it's like two houses. (laughs) They've upped it a little bit two washing machines. Um, but I think I'm, I am fascinated by that. And I think that in, in many ways, family is very important to me. Um, the, the, the part B of your question is, so I, I'm adopted. I'm up for adoption again soon. I always offer that to people if anyone's <laughs> looking for me and my entire family. Uh, we're all willing, uh, perhaps to another country if someone could provide citizenship and deep cover. Um, but I think I think that that, that sense of... Um, attachment and depth and the sense too it fascinates me the ways in which people talk about you know their blood relation as being more profound and and more the thing that people always return to than what we now sort of talk about about families of choice and the people that we surround ourselves with uh i just think it is the you know one of the narrative cores of storytelling you know it all starts there i mean adam and eve made a family they didn't call it that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, as you Mary said, gave birth to a family. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned there, you yeah. know, that your your adoption and and the meeting your sort of birth family yeah. only when you were in your thirties. In my thirties, so right? that was you obviously dealt with that in your writing before you met your family. You were already exploring this a little idea. bit, yeah. Um, but you have written a non-fiction book about about. The mistress's daughter. Yes. Yeah. Um, which was easier to write? Was it? Was it? Sort of. Do you find it easier to explore the idea of the family in, in fiction, or? You know, no one's ever asked me that question before, and I would a hundred percent say a, a, in fiction. I mean, I really am a fiction writer, and as much as I explore ideas like family and things that I'm really drawn to, and, and sort of 
personal alienation <laughs> and all of these things, um, I really write from my imagination. So I think the threads that are relevant to me sort of come into it, but I'm working from my imagination and it is so much easier to write fictionally because in a way you can write more truthfully than when you're actually writing nonfiction and you are bounded by chronology and bounded by fact, uh, which I know has become blurry in our current time, what chronology or fact might be. But I, I firmly believe there are chronologies and facts and, and a kind of reality to things. And, and I'm, I'm especially mindful as someone who does write both fiction and nonfiction of when those lines are being crossed. And so I really love the world of fiction. It lets me talk about everything I want to talk about and build worlds that have a kind of depth and nuance to them that I find harder to achieve in nonfiction. So A.M. Holmes featured briefly in our episode called Sex, because uh, I read a bit from her book Music for Torching, which, uh, as I mentioned in that episode, begins with a, a kind of nuclear-looking family who seem to have everything, deciding to burn their own house to the ground in order to shake things up in their life. <laughs> and that's just like typical A.M. Holmes. Like She takes something like that and just blows it apart. Um, and I like the way that she was saying there about how writing about family was much easier in fiction and so much mm. harder when it came to writing about her own family. Yeah, well, it's interesting that we've got A.M. Holmes there and Jeanette Winterson, both of whom who have done that process, because Jeanette obviously wrote, there I am, calling her Jeanette again. <laughs> <laughs> Jeanette, <Your> Win- <laughs> Me and Jeanette. Um, <laughs> Jeanette Winterson has uh, written Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, which mm-hmm. is obviously kind of autobiographical, and also Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit. And you certainly sense that in oranges and especially within oranges you have this kind of like like autobiographical fiction but then within that autobiographical fiction you have something quite removed and like fantastical um and so you really from her i know she didn't touch it in her clip but you get the sense that she's finding that easy to play with and kind Mm -hmm. of doing this work of yeah of imagining family or playing with that idea of family I suppose it's taking the notions that you are familiar with and that you have lived through and fictionalising those, but also drawing on experiences that you've heard about from other people. And that probably makes it so much easier because you can cover up some of the truth that has happened and make things out to be either much worse than they could have been or really kind of rose tinted glasses them. I think it's weird. I mean, we didn't plan it this way, but actually the fact that these two authors that we've played so far both adopted, both working in fiction and non-fiction, yeah. both playing with these ideas. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, of course there are gazillions of writers who are not adopted, but it's just interesting that they've, they've both achieved great success mm. through what they've imagined. And I wonder whether the fact that they're adopted has, has played into that in some well, way. It plays a huge part in fiction generally, no? Having, like, not necessarily from the author's perspective, but also the character's perspective, having, I mean, who's coming to mind, Oliver Twist, uh-huh. an adopted child i was um, going to say jacqueline wilson jacqueline wilson fine. yeah tracy Be- tracy beaker <laughs> yeah yeah another oh prime tracy. Example. like there's there's scores of them mm. um and i think it is in part because it's it provides some form of freedom against what am holmes has described as like the shackles of family you yeah, know, this yeah, kind yeah. Of like, you speak about the exploding house yeah mm. the dumping ground is the exploded house <laughs> <laughs> We will cut. It's so interesting to see whether any of these books come up in the bookseller recommendations at the end of this episode when they get to, to sort of you know recommend books based on family. I mean, I was really intrigued by this idea of her finding it much harder to write nonfiction about her own family, partly because it's going to lead us very neatly into our final author, because this is Emily Pine, who has written recently a, a collection of, of personal essays, I guess you would call them, called Notes to Self. And they deal with all sorts of things, um, addiction and uh, violence, sexual violence against women, uh, feminism. Um, But they also, I suppose, as an almost overarching thing, is kind of about family. Mm. Um, But it's very much nonfiction written about her own family. And it's searingly honest. She Mm. is just, you know, she puts it all there on the page. And so when I got a chance to speak to her, I wanted to know how easy was it for her to actually put that stuff on the page given that it was her own family that she was talking about? In some ways it's very difficult to write about the things that you're closest to and that you feel emotionally strongest about and so I think the process of writing about my family was like estranging myself from them in some way so that I could stand back and look at them and in a strange way because my father has been an alcoholic all my life and that broke the family and tried to break me and my dad. And obviously for him, it's the, it's the major issue. But 
because of that, I had always, I had always looked at him and analysed him. Mm. And so when it came to writing about him going into liver failure and so on, I, I already had kind of a, a dialogue in my head that had been running for years about him and me and how I, where I stood in relation to that. And because when you, love, when you have an addict in the family, you, are, you have a relationship with two people. Uh, with the addict and, and the person and you try and project all the negative stuff onto the illness and love the person but it's a really difficult boundary to maintain. It was harder I think when I looked at the other members of my, I mean I have a really small family so it's just you know my parents and my sister and myself and um, it was harder to look at them because I'm so close to them and so I found having to write about them, I had to try and take the emotion out of it and just write a series of events. Like this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And in some ways that closeness gave me, I mean, that's where you get the access, right? That's where you get up close and personal, but it's also then it feels like an abuse of that closeness to write about them. And I was very conscious of that. I was really conscious of trying not to self-censor because of that emotional connection. Mm. And I think trying to take the emotion out of it was a way around censorship. I'm also really lucky that my family were okay with me having done this. I never had to ask myself what I would do if they said no, because they did give me permission. But at the same time, I think, I mean, my mother said, you know, people normally wait till their parents are dead <laughs> they, before, they, before they write about them in this way. And, uh, and, and also to recognize that she is from very much from a generation that did not talk about, you know, did not air the dirty laundry of a family in public. And this is verboten as a result. And so what I have done goes against every instinct she has. And so it was very brave for her to be okay with me doing it. And, and, and I understand, I feel like I have a foot in that generation and I'm also linked to a, a generation that I think are breaking taboos and stigmas. So I feel that, that opening the, the door on my family, but really it was always opening the door on myself, right? And so in writing any kind of life story, you have to think about your own boundaries. Where do you begin and end? And where does your family begin and end? And that can be fraught. I don't know, so when you look at your family, and you write about them, and you write about the ugly or difficult emotions as well as the positive ones, and the positive ones are really important to include too. You break the fiction that families require to operate, that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you, because you can't on a daily basis say, oh, can we talk again about like how difficult X, Y, or Z is? You can't, you just have to get on with it. And so by putting it down on the page and publishing it, you are creating a narrative that makes it impossible for people to ignore um, the fact that something has been said. And so I think actually the process of writing is then followed by a process of trying to get away from the writing, where we will just try and recover from this terrible thing that I have done. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't regret it, and I am incredibly grateful to my family. And I think, actually, for me, the testament that we are a really strong unit, though maybe two separate units is a better way of thinking of it, because my parents are not together. And the testament to us as a family is how we have responded to the crisis of me writing about the family. Because that, that crisis is very, I mean, I'm thinking of other authors who have written what's often described as auto-fiction, which is, you know, fiction which has that sort of basis in fact. And, and it's been disastrous for families. It has broken them apart because the people who are being depicted feel violated mm. and that's been taken away. You, you mentioned the, the moment when you write about your father and give him the piece to, to read and he gave you a very simple but quite beautiful response actually when you did that. Yeah, he, um, and he reads really fast so I was kind of sitting by my, I emailed it to him and I was sitting by my computer because we live in different countries and uh, it came back and it was really, really short and it just said it is beautiful and it is brave and I was blown away by that, the generosity of that as a response, because 
not only was it a kind response from a father to a daughter, but it was a response from one writer to another writer. And I felt respected and seen in that moment. And that just meant a lot. That doesn't mean that we don't argue about stuff still. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, and now we're all great. Um, but I, I think that, um, and, and my whole family read it in draft form as it was emerging. And, and you mentioned autofiction and it's important to me to say this is, this is not at all and that they were able to come in and say you know you have you misremember that a little bit or you have the the time like the time of day wrong and when that happened and so on and so it's not like it became a group project but I definitely relied on well I relied on their memories mm. um, but I relied on the their sense their having been there and making it with me um, there was one moment where that slightly gave me pause because in the book I write about a really difficult thing that the family went through and my mother myself and my sister were there and my mother read it and rang me afterwards and said that's exactly what happened that's exactly what it felt like and on the one hand that was an enormous validation mm. and on the other I thought it was really dangerous because she was in the room at exactly the same time but she can't have experienced it the way I did mm. because I can only write from my own perspective so you know my other family members should get to have their own narratives. And so I think the, a, a writer in the family is dangerous, not just because of what they expose about the private life of the family, but also how we enshrine a particular narrative. And it's very difficult then, I think, for other people to say, no, that's not my version of it, that's not my story. Mm. Um, but at the same time, really important for them to say, because they would write different different narratives, different lives. And I think that that's really exciting. You see, as you say, your family is almost in two separate parts. And so we have the story of your, your father and his battle with alcoholism. Um, you do mention your parents' divorce and there's something very um, particularly Irish about that because of the way that you, of course, couldn't get divorced. Well, they're not Yeah, divorced. they're not divorced, yeah, yeah. even to this day. Uh, their sort of separation um, is very particular. Uh, Becoming to sort of slightly more, I suppose, more modern angle, your relationship with your sister, I found really intriguing because it, I guess it taps into this idea of the continuation of the family. Mm -hmm. And you write incredibly honestly about your reaction to your sister announcing that she's pregnant. Do you, do you mind if we talk a little bit about that? Because it was obviously very, very emotive, but it felt to me incredibly brave for you to put that on paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you like that moment. Um, my sister and I are incredibly close. There's five years between us. So when we were kids, we fought like cats and dogs because uh, five years is just too much. But now it seems it feels like the perfect gap, and we're usually at different, sli we're slightly different stages in our lives. And I had spent years trying to get pregnant, and as had she. And, but she was just five years younger than me and so she was able to and I had had a miscarriage recently and so when she told me about her pregnancy I, I was so rooted in my own place in my life that I couldn't relate to her as my sister and my darling sister and she had wanted this so much and she is such a fantastic mother and I, if there's one thing I regret, I don't really believe in regrets, it is how long it took me. I mean, it took me about 24, 36 hours to kind of realise, oh my goodness, there's going to be a baby. And, uh, but it's funny because when we were small, um, we had joked about the fact that um, it, being a parent looked like a pain. I mean, our, pa <laughs> our parents made it look kind of painful, right? And being a parent, so maybe we could just have have children and share them between us right. and we would kind of you know pass them between us and this was always our plan and then as we grew older and we were slightly skeptical about the men we were involved with and we would say okay well our real partnership is with each other and we'll just you know men are purely decorative and <laughs> apologies for writing off an entire gender in that way but this idea was that ours was the core relationship um, and uh, that we and so it's extraordinary so in a really in a really long view, I could say that we managed that so that um, she and I, she is so generous now because I, I didn't manage to have children that one day a week I 
go out and I spend with her and her son and pick him up from crash and, and hang out with them and you know making we make family dinners together and that is just the most special part of my life alongside the other parts that you know are happy too um, but, and with my actual real life partner <laughs> I shouldn't really leave out of the narrative but uh, who's more than decorative um, but that I think I think makes me nostalgic for for fa- thinking about families outside of this idea that there is there there is a p- parents two parents and children and that we live in these little isolated uh, bubbles and don't and only see each other for you know the holidays and things and actually the family life should be integrated uh, much more and perhaps because we grew up neither of my parents have siblings and so we na- never had aunts or uncles and so for me now to be an aunt is a very pre- very precious relationship and um, that I get to perform in a in a way that I I wanted to be a parent I didn't get to have that but I think it forces you to be more imaginative about what you can have and not ignore the things that you do have you you mentioned the the instinct to have a child was came from seeing another mother with her child and seeing the the love Mm -hmm. between her and her child. And you then mentioned feeling that exact emotion with your... Nephew. I was about to say, yeah, sorry, with your your nephew. And that it was the same thing. Not not that you didn't need to have your own children, but you were were getting what, what you had wanted from that relationship, which is completely different. Yeah, and I think seeing it as that love is enormously equal actually it's not better in one scenario than in another and then also the amazing thing about little kids who you know obviously his mummy and his daddy are his his main people in his life but he loves auntie and grandma as well and that is extraordinary and he doesn't discriminate in terms of you know the kind of love that he gives out because he hasn't learned that that's what you're meant to do yet and so when he gives you a hug that's it he's all in (laughs) and I love that and he my sister sent me a video the other day of him playing in the garden and he runs over to her and says I have news for you mummy (laughs) which sounds like it's going to be really serious and uh, she said oh yeah what is this news she goes I love you and then he runs off and you just think oh wow (laughs) A, she has it on video now, so <laughs> she has it forever. But B, I mean, just, just extraordinary. And he is that kind of really giving little boy. He's um, really outgoing and, and um, open with his emotions, like, like all kids are. You know, all kids are lovable and all kids are loving. And uh, it's just, it's, you know, it, it's just as we be- become adults, we learn to squash that down because it's not appropriate or because you get hurt or whatever else. And so it's just... I think that is one of the extraordinary things about being around children is uh, what we could learn. Well, isn't she absolutely marvellous? Oh, it's just a dream. She's so good. And reading Notes to Self, I think for me, reading it was one of kind of the most personal pieces of writing that I have ever encountered about families and relationships and especially that female companionship that she writes so well about. It's just a really, really fantastic book. I... I want to erase my memory and just read it over and over again. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it so much. I think it's part. There seems to be a raft of publishing at the moment where there are um, some amazingly brave female writers, and it's almost like there's been this collective moment. I don't know if mm. it's connected to me too, but it's a bit like women have gone. Do you know what? I'm just going to put this down on paper, absolutely honestly. And they're being mm. far more honest, mm. it seems to me, than the male writers are. And so I've read, a, I think, about three or four books already this year where I've gone, wow, like yes. that's all there on the page. Mm. And she, even when speaking to her, like she, she's so honest in that mm. clip. There's really nothing to add because she just puts it all there so eloquently, so well thought out, so well expressed. Um, and so many amazing thoughts about what, what family actually is. Yes, and that's what I found throughout, is that she will write about these experiences, she writes about things that have happened, but the feelings that she kind of feels throughout, and she does. she's not ashamed of any anger or guilt that she has towards these scenarios. She's just really understanding that these are natural reactions that come from it. Anybody would have those reactions mm. put in those situations. I think what we're saying is, 
buy notes to self and read it. It's it's really it's really brilliant. And, and Dan, buy it for other people. Yeah, absolutely. Dan, maybe we should buy it for you as your leaving gift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make me more self aware. Well, yes, <laughs> because we are, I'm afraid we're coming very close to the end of this episode, which means the, the end of Dan's time on the podcast. But before we get to the end, um, we're going to introduce our booksellers. They're going to give us their recommendations based on this theme of family. Um, but remember, whatever it is you're looking for in a bookshop, it's always worth asking your bookseller. Hi, I'm Alison from Barry St Edmunds and a great book to read about the theme family would be The Unmumsy Mum by Sarah Turner because it documents all the highs and lows of parenting in a funny, honest way but doesn't shy away from the more taboo feelings which many of us don't discuss, especially as new parents. A refreshing read to remind you that every parent is going through the same thing. Hi, I'm Becky from Cheltenham and a great book to read about family would be Nevermind by Edward St. Auburn. It's the first book in the Patrick Melrose series and it focuses on the father character. And I knew after reading this book that there was no way I was going to abandon the series before the end. I love the disgusting privilege and abhorrent behaviour of the father figure. It's awful and despicable and so well written as to make it almost juicy and funny. It's one of the best books I've ever read and sets up nicely for a phenomenal series. Hi, my name is Paul. I work at the Brownwood Store and I think a great book to read about family would be Educated by Tara Westover. In it, it looks at what happens when the strength of the bonds of family and the beliefs in which uh, she has been indoctrinated then clash and come up against the ideas which she is learning and seeing for herself and the complications which come with that. It's an absolutely fantastic book. So there we go. Season one of the Waterstones podcast is coming to a close. Dan and Holly, I can't thank you enough. It's been an absolute treat for me. I hope it's been nice for you. Yes, it has. Thank you so... <laughs> so I, so I, labour. I, so unconvincing. I have like these real mixed emotions about it because I've absolutely loved doing it, but I'm just a bit sad that Dan won't be doing with, it with us again. I know. Uh, but no, it's been an absolute pleasure. Oh. Loved it. Well, we hope that you as listeners have enjoyed this as well. This is the end of season one, but there is going to be a season two. And the good news is that you won't even have to wait that long for it. The first episode of season two will be going live on the 30th of October and rather fittingly, it will be entitled Haunting. We'll be joined in the studio by Stephen Chbosky, the author of The Perks of Being a Wallflower. He'll be talking to us about his new novel, Imaginary Friend. And there'll also be ghostly goings on with Andrew Michael Hurley, the author of Starbaker, and a genuine true ghost story from Jeanette Winterson. And there'll be another five episodes after that. We'll be looking at the themes of outside, culture, community, meetings, and finishing off with eating. And if that's not enough to get your mouth watering or your ears what can ears water bleeding ears? i don't know what ears <laughs> hey, would do that's rude. hopefully they're <laughs> hopefully they're flapping and ready um but yes uh, we'll, we'll be ready soon um and also of course we always like to hear your feedback so you can email us on social at waterstones.com and you can of course leave ratings and reviews on your podcast platform of choice uh, we will see you in a few weeks time and until then goodbye from all of us here goodbye so long 